that back there? That's me. I was close to Jesus. I grew up in church. I could sing all the songs. I could tell you all the Bible stories. But then things in my life got tough. And I turned my back on everything that I believed. See, growing up in church, I always heard this story about Peter and how he denied Jesus. I always thought, how could he do that? He walked with Jesus. He was an eyewitness to every miracle that he performed. Yet he still turned his back on him. But now I know how easy it is to do. See, for me, I was close to Jesus. I was close to Jesus, and then I turned my back on him. I even experienced miracles that he performed in my own life. But do you know what my favorite part of this story is? It doesn't end here. It's actually just the beginning for Peter. You see, Peter came back, and he went on to change the world. That's when I knew denial didn't have to be the end of my story. If you've turned your back on Jesus, it doesn't have to be the end of your story either. See, for me, I walked away, but I didn't stay there. I'm happy to say that I'm like the prodigal who came home. And I can't wait to see what God has in store for me next. At the tomb that day Just shuffling soldiers' feet As they guarded the grave One day, two days Three days had passed Could it be that Jesus Had breathed his last could it be that his father had forsaken him? Turned his back on his son, despising our sin. All hell seemed to whisper, just forget it, he's dead. Then the father looked down to his son and said Arise my love Arise my love The grave no longer has a hold on you No more testing No more suffering tomb began to shake and like lightning from heaven the stone was rolled away and as dead men the gods they all stood there in fright as the power of love displayed its might then suddenly a melody filled the air Riding wings of wind, it was everywhere The words that creation had been longing to hear The sweet sound of victory was so loud and clear and he said, Arise, my love, arise, my love. The grave no longer has a hold on you. No more death 
resting, no more suffering. Arise, arise. Sin, where are your shackles? And death, where is your sting? The hell has been defeated. The grave could not hold the king. Arise, my love. Arise, my love. The grave no as a hold on you, no more destiny and no more suffering. Arise, arise, arise. Well, good morning, and welcome to this unique Easter experience. It's going to be a great Easter, is it not? And uh, we're glad that you have chosen to come and be with us here on this Easter. And uh, it, to us, as a believer, it is the most important day of the entire year. Amen? Because it's not just another day. This is the day, the most important day of any other day of the year. This is the day, the resurrection day. It's not just a, a, a nice day. It's not just another Sunday to come to church. It is Resurrection Sunday. You look historically, and this day is a turning point in history. It's an actual fact. But you might ask, so what's the big deal? I mean, really, what, what, what importance does the resurrection of Jesus some 2,000 years ago really have to do with anything about me today? Sure, it's a nice day for Easter egg hunts and family get-togethers and a family meal and all kinds of other activities throughout today, but really, what's this day supposed to mean? What difference does it really make? I mean, I, 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 I come from a practical standpoint this morning, and I have to ask, what good does it do me? Have you ever asked that question? If you're like me, you have. Because this day is, is a unique day. And let's be honest, we're all busy people. We all have a, a, a thousand things in which we're supposed to do. We've got a thousand things on our mind. And who really has the time to think about some event that happened some 2,000 years ago? Well, I want to be bold with you this morning. And I want to tell you that this day means more than anything else that you could ever imagine or do. It applies to me today, and guess what? It applies to you as well, right here, right now. And it can and should make a huge difference in our lives, not just once a year, but in our daily lives, every day of the week, 365 days a year. And so, yes, this morning, Easter does make a difference right here and right now. And so this morning, I want to show you that difference and so uh, most of you already know this passage. You've probably memorized it or have heard it at some point. It is the most familiar passage of all, all the scripture. And it's found in John's gospel, chapter 3 and verse 16. And again, you've probably heard it. You've probably seen it. But let me tell you what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Believe it or not, that simple verse, the most familiar verse out of all the scripture, reveals three wonderful, amazing, life-changing principles that if we will catch a hold of, they're things that are true, absolutely true for me and absolutely true for you, or they can be before you ever leave this place today. 
And the very first one of those things that this passage of Scripture reveals is an immeasurable love. And in that immeasurable love, it's the fact that Jesus lived for me. And he lived for you too. John 3.16 begins with those words, For God so loved. You see, Jesus came to this earth because of love. He lived a life of love. And he came with a clear mission, one sole purpose. And we find in Scripture, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, it says, The Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. And again, if you're like me, one of the questions that ought to pop up is, okay, so what was lost in the first place? Well, the answer to that question is easy. I was. (laughs) You were. And without Jesus coming, there was no redemption. There was no salvation. There was just this constant loss. Because from the moment that sin entered into the world, It entered into every human life as well. Every one of us. Nobody's exempt. From the very moment that most of us could speak, we learned those words. No, that's mine. And our sinful, rebellious ways started, and they proceeded from there. And again, if you're like me, they still proceed to this day. But the Bible calls this sin. And it not only creates a problem in us, it creates problems for us. For you see, sin damages relationships, it divides families, it destroys hope of a loving and eternal relationship with God. The kind of relationship that his heart longs for, and if we're honest, ours do too. That's why we search for answers. And so God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit unveiled a a mind-boggling plan, one, one of which is kind of unbelievable. Jesus, who was God's Son, His only Son, through whom God created the entire world and everything in it, chose to set aside His power and His glory and descend to earth in the humble form of a man. And He did it for love, love for you love for me and love for every one of us in this room oh i love rose bushes they're so fragrant so beautiful when they bloom but did you know that the bible refers to jesus poetically as a rose and so when I look at a rose bush i i see the blooms and the blossoms and i i can't help but think that You know what, maybe this rose, this plant, represents Jesus. Because after all, Jesus lived a a very beautiful and fragrant life of love. Jesus literally brought the immeasurable love of God to earth in plain clothes. And he showed us that it's love for everyone. Man, woman, young or old, light or dark then and now. But you know what I hope this Easter? I hope that this Easter you can feel and know and own the love of Jesus for you. No matter what you've done, no matter how you feel, regardless of whatever dirt or darkness is in your life right now, you can know the measureless, matchless love of Jesus. That back there, that's me. I always thought that God was distant. I always thought he was sitting up in heaven and he didn't care what happened in my life. But lately, I started to realize just how wrong I was. That's my story. Not that I committed adultery, but I was caught in my own sin. 
and I felt like everyone was judging me. I was judging myself. I was ready for the worst. And I honestly felt like there was no hope. And then someone invited me to church. And I really didn't want to go. But I thought, what have I got to lose? And when I got there, I heard about Jesus. Someone who could reach down and rescue me. Someone who could forgive me for all my sins, even the ones I couldn't forgive myself for. You see, I didn't think I deserved to be forgiven. I didn't think I could be forgiven. I thought I had to walk through things alone. And then I heard that Jesus, he could reach down and rescue me out of the dirt and darkness in my life. He gave me hope when I didn't think there was any hope left. And do you know what I realize now? That this, this is what Jesus wants to do for all of us. Wherever you are, whatever mess you have found yourself in, he's reaching down for you, ready to help you out. All you have to do is take his hand. So what does the resurrection mean? The resurrection means that what Jesus did for the people that he met in his lifetime, the sinful, the lepers, the disabled, the sick, the dying. What he did for them, he wants to do for me. And he wants to do for you as well. And wherever you are today, whatever mountain you're on or whatever valley that you seem to be in, he is reaching down for you with love. And all you have to do is to take his hand. For God so loved the world. For God so loved me. If you can accept that, if you can believe that, for God so loved the world. For God so loved me. And that leads us to the, the second wonderful truth that I want to impress on you today. One more thing that's true for you, or that can be before you leave this place today. Not only was there an immeasurable love that Jesus lived for me and for you, there was an astounding sacrifice. The fact that Jesus died for us. You know, if you're familiar with rose bushes at all, Maybe you've gotten a bouquet of them for Valentine's Day or on your birthday or special times during the year. And as lovely as the flowers are, probably there's a good chance that you've been stuck by the presents that line up and down each stem and across the bush. Those thorns hurt, don't they? <laughs> In fact, there's nothing like the thorn of a rose bush that penetrates the skin. But you know what, when I look at a rose, I not only see the love, the immeasurable beauty and fragrance of who Christ is, I also see the thorns and realize that those thorns are there for a reason because they represent the pain and the suffering, the sacrifice 
as Jesus, as depicted in that text that says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. In Jesus' 33 years of life, he lived a life that was completely free of sin. He lived a life that was full of love and compassion for men and women and children. But you know, even after he performed miracle after miracle, and he showed thousands of people that he truly was the Son of God, he still had one thing yet to do because his mission was not fully accomplished. There was still one humiliating, painful, sacrificial act that had to be completed. Jesus had to die. Because that's why he came. Jesus came to earth to die for you and for me. His sacrifice, yes, was ugly, but it was beautiful all at the same time. Oh, those whips that scored his back, the crown of thorns that pierced his brow, the nails that pinned him painfully to the cross, all speak of the hideousness of sin, the terrible price of our greed and our pride and murder and theft and greed. And yes, the list goes on and on and on and on. And that ugliness touches every human soul. For you see, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one is free of sin. So God, in his ultimate love, gave his only son to take our punishment upon himself. And Jesus allowed himself to be arrested and tortured and mocked and then executed by the most horrific form possible, a slow and painful death on a cross. In fact, that pain introduced a new word into the human vocabulary. Maybe you've heard it. It's a word called excruciating. Did you know that excruciating literally means the pain of the cross? Because it goes back to that day in history where Jesus died for you and for me. It goes back to that day where his death paid the price for every sin that you've ever committed. And his sacrifice provides the one and only way to find real forgiveness and cleansing. And yes, the joy of a brand new start and a brand new life. Oh, but I got to tell you, there is so, so much more than just the cross. Jesus knows you. He knows what it means to see the world through the eyes of a child. He knows what it means to eat with friends. And Jesus also knows how it feels to be hurt. feel completely alone, to be betrayed, he knows how it feels to face accusation, Jesus lived on the earth just like us, but he also paid the ultimate price to free us. He was beaten, forced to carry a cross through the streets of Jerusalem. He had eight inch spikes driven through his hands and his feet. And he thought of us, how deeply he loves us, how completely he forgave us. After he died, he was buried in a rich man's tomb. But here's the good news. Jesus didn't stay in the grave. He rose again. He walked out of the tomb. And now we can walk with him. 
see Jesus' astonishing sacrifice on the cross reveal just how great his love is for each of us, for you, for me. He understands you. And how, how he fully feels your sin and your shame, your pain and your hurt. He knows. He knows your disappointment and your discouragement and your distress. You see, Jesus understands every single bit of it. And he longs to forgive and to free you from sin. To lift you up and to turn you around because it took all of that, every bit of it, the nails, the thorn, the death. It took all of that because when he died, he took your sin with it. <laughs> it was nailed there with Jesus on the cross. And it died there on that day with him so that you could be free of it all. And you can live free because he died for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And so, yes, there was an immeasurable love in the fact that Jesus lived for you. There was an astonishing sacrifice in that Jesus died for you. But don't miss this third wonderful truth that you can leave here today knowing absolutely sure and it's this that his death on the cross provided an enduring hope why because he rose for us i'm no expert on roses i've tried to grow them through the years and especially up here it's a little tough because the deer tend to munch on them a lot more than i can get out and take care of them but you know i'm told that the secret to the, to the most fullest and loveliest roses is something called pruning. And I hear that there's a lot of disagreement as to you know, how and when you should prune by all of the experts, but there's not an expert that will disagree with the fact that every rose bush should be pruned. And pruning can be a scary thing because you, you take these roses that are alive and you think, man, if I cut them off, I'm destroying the bush. If I take and I cut the beauty away, it's going to die. And we think, man, is it ever going to bloom again? Is it ever going to be restored back to its full and beautiful rose bush that it was intended to be? Because pruning could be a very scary thing. But I can tell you that the Gospel of John describes the burial of Jesus like this. And when I look at a rose bush and I look at the beautiful flowers and the thorns that are on it and then the time for pruning, I cannot help but think of the time that they took Jesus from the cross and put him in the grave. Listen to how John records it. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid before because it was the Jewish day of preparation. And since the tomb was empty and nearby, they laid Jesus there. To all Jesus' family and friends and followers, to them, it was over. They were devastated. How could they have thought that he was the Savior, the one who was going to redeem, the one that they had been looking for all of these years. And now, he was gone. He was dead. Oh, they had such great hopes. They had such great aspirations. But now, their Lord, their Messiah, their Savior, Jesus, he was dead. Wrapped in grave clothes. And buried in an ugly and a barren and a cold, cold tomb. He died here today. They paraded him down that road, pushing and shoving him in the crowded street, moving slowly towards the city gate. 
and the crowd pressed in on him, taunting and mocking the bruised and bloody form of a man. He dragged that murderous cross as he progressed down that torturous path. Each step was anguish as the huge cross being pressed into his already torn and bloody shoulder. And they laid him here. And they nailed him to that wooden beam. The scream of anguish that came from this hill still rings in my ears as the nails punctured the flesh of his hands and feet. His tired and beaten body was delirious with pain as they lifted the cross to the sky and they dropped it into the hole with a thud. As the nails tore through his flesh and tendons, my heart was pierced as well. A journey that began in a throne in glory through a manger in Bethlehem was now complete. He traveled from the very heights of heaven's glory to the very pit of hell. And he died here today. He was buried here today. They lowered Jesus' bruised and bloody body down from the cross and into the arms of his mother. And she cried. No, not crying. It was more like suffocating. And the tears that poured down her cheeks were the tears that only a mother could shed. Her gut-wrenching sobs were engulfed in a sea of darkness and despair. But the anguish was not hers alone. It was shared by all the weary, haggard, heartbroken followers who helped prepare his emaciated body for burial. In the darkness that consumed us all, we carried his body from that dark, violent hill to a place nearby. A place that stood in stark contrast to the place of execution, a place of peace and quiet. A place where the birds sang their sweet melodies amidst the olive trees and beautiful gardens. A, a garden where the sounds of shuffling feet and quivering sobs were the only sounds to break the silence of the evening as Jesus' limp, lifeless body was laid to rest. The man who had brought so much warmth and light into the world now lay in a tomb so cold and dark. I will walk away from this tomb, but it will be impossible to walk away from the flood of haunting memories. I cannot rid myself of the sound of an angry mob or soldiers pushing and shoving to clear the way. I can still see the hammer fall and hear the cries of pain. I will never forget the blood, the tears, or the smell of death that filled my nostrils. The darkness and despair of this shadowy afternoon will be etched in my memory forever. He rose here today. Yes, that's what they said. He just got up and walked out. Just saying those words seem strange to me. My heart has not yet fully grasped the thought of his death, and now they're saying he lives? Must I see to believe? Didn't he say his kingdom would last forever? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he told Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave, that he gave his only begotten son. Yes, that's it. Abraham and Isaac, the substitute sacrifice. Jesus was a substitute sacrifice. He died for someone else. Yes, yes, my Jesus, he died, 
he died for, oh, oh no, could it be, could it really be, my Lord, did you die for me? Oh, Lord, you did this all for me. And the truth of the matter is, he did it for you and me as well. Aren't you glad that the story didn't end there? Aren't you glad that he completed the process and he rose from the grave? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. The oldest surviving manuscripts and the account of that first Easter was written just a few short years after the actual events. And in Mark's gospel, he describes it like this. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Siloam, brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. And very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they got there and they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? But go now and tell his disciples and Peter he is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. We know that Mark's gospel is true because after that point, they did see him. And not just the few disciples. Scripture tells us that well over 500 people physically saw Jesus before his ascension into heaven. Pruning a rose bush doesn't make the rose bush dead, does it? Just because it was pruned doesn't mean that it's going to die. Because in a few weeks, I promise you that that rose bush is going to bloom again. And with those blooms, the beautiful and fragrance that comes from those blooms, it's going to fulfill all of the promise of springtime, new life, and new blooms. And yes, new beauty. And that's why I think the rose bush is so symbolic of the life of Jesus. And it's a fitting symbol for us this Easter. Because as Jesus burst forth from the tomb, fragrant and beautiful, splendor, and in all his glory, he did it because he loves you. And he did it because he loves me. And in that symbol is yet another wonderful truth that is so incredibly important for us to comprehend. And that is this, that Jesus not only lived for you, not only died for you, but he rose for you as well. In fact, Jesus' resurrection completes the message of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, listen to this, will not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved you that he gave Jesus for you. And that by believing in him, you can escape the sorrow and the death and the punishment and hell, yes, that our sins deserve. And in exchange, you get fulfilled life. 
you get fulfilled hope. And it all replaces the fears and the sufferings with the love, the incredible love of Jesus. And not just for this life. Because Jesus didn't just come for the disciples and the people of his time. He came for all people of all time. And the realization is, it's not just fulfillment in this life. But whoever believes in him will not perish, talking about life eternal. That there's more than the 80 or 90 years that we get to experience life on this earth. And I can guarantee you that everything that we experience, the memories, the joy, will seem utterly pale in comparison to what lies ahead because of the love of Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. My question for you this morning is, do you believe that? (laughs) Well, I hope you do. In fact, I hope you find it impossible to hear the cries and the news of Jesus' immeasurable love for you. I hope you find it impossible as you hear about his astonishing sacrifice and his enduring hope that he offers you and still say no to it all. Oh, I hope you can do. I hope you find it impossible to say thanks, but no. And ultimately, I find and hope you find it impossible to even say maybe. Because when it comes down to it, is there any way, reality-wise, is there any way that you can say no to this man named Jesus, to the Savior, to the Messiah who came for you.
Hello, my name is Melissa Missler. I'm the volunteer director for the Tapestry Network of Nevada County, formerly known as the BAM Project. We are a Christian business women's organization serving the community while cross-marketing each other's businesses. We serve 24 local nonprofits each year. Each month, we host a dinner benefiting a nonprofit as well as going out to serve our community. We raised over $6,000 our first year and are well on our way to doubling that in our second. Our monthly tapestry gathering includes a light dinner, guest speaker, worship, and structured networking opportunities. We have events and resources to provide you with fellowship, business growth, and spiritual enrichment. We are a nationwide network of Christian businesswomen and are similar to a chamber of commerce collaborating with business referrals, local nonprofits, with our focus on Christ. We are Christian women growing in faith and business. We invite you to come play with us.